Okay, in this video we're going to discuss variation in a data set. So we talked about where the center of the data set is measured, that was the measures of central tendency topic. But that's not the total picture. We want to know more than just where things are centered. You know, it's fine to know what typically happens, you know, where the center occurs. But then the question is, when things don't go the typical or average way, then how do they turn out? Because that's an important or relevant question. You know? Let's take an example here that I've created on the board. Um, let's imagine that this is the uh, dimension of a screw, and that screw is maybe vital for the functioning of an automobile. So maybe it holds something, like it's part of the engine mount or something, and keeps the engine in a stable, secure position so it doesn't rattle too much, create too much vibration. Now let's say that this screw is supposed to be, just for argument's sake, one inch in length. And you have two manufacturing systems, a system here, a system here. At this factory, the manufacturing occurs and produces an average length of the bolt at one inch, right? We can see that it sometimes is not exactly one inch, but it doesn't vary too much from that point. It's a little after, so maybe that's like 1.1 inches or 1.2 inches. Maybe this is 0 0.9, 0 0.8 inches, something like that. But then look at this data set. It also has an average of one inch. Remember, average is where you'd have to stick your finger to balance out the data set. So we can tell this is the average of the set. But you see that there's far more variation, right? Far more deviation from the center part. And that's a problem because, you know, even though they both have an average of one inch, both factories could claim they produce these bolts with an average dimension that's according to the specifications for the product. The problem with this is that this variation is too great. It could be that for the car to function properly, you can't have screws that are, or bolts that are longer than 1.3 inches or shorter than, say, 0.7 inches. And that means all of these bolts produced by this factory would not be useful. And if they went into the car, they would cause the car to be less reliable, or they may not even be used at all and would have to be thrown away. So clearly, variation is an important concept, right? This factory, having the same average as this one, this factory is still the better choice because it's more consistent, more reliable, more dependable. This one, too much variation. Lots of products perhaps may not be functionable that are coming off of the line. This is inefficient. This is much more efficient. And generally, we find that throughout science is that you know, a data set that's more homogeneous, more clustered around its center, is going to be easier to make predictions about. It's a mark of quality when it comes to manufacturing. And in the world of science and research, it's helpful because it allows us to make statements. When I say that the typical bolt that comes out of this factory is one inch, that's a pretty true statement because even when it's not one inch, it's pretty close to it. If I say in this factory the typical bolt is one inch, that's true, but there are going to be lots of times people may encounter bolts that are too far away from that. That you would say, my goodness, you know, it's supposed to be typically one inch, but this bolt's almost two inches and this one's almost no inches long. So at that point, you know, the statement that bolts that come out of this factory are typically one inch, it would start to seem like maybe that's not true in this data set. Whereas this one, people would be much more trusting of it because they would experience that in the real world. This one, they would sometimes experience one inch, but might too often experience scenarios where it's uh, too far from that mark. Okay, so how do we measure this thing? Obviously, it's an important idea. We want to be able to measure this variation in some way. Well, let's look at this calculation, maybe the simplest way to measure that, the range. And this is often used for a very small set of numbers. The range just looks at the highest number minus the low number. So we'd say it's the high minus the low. If you subtract those, you end up with the range. So for in this data set, the lowest numbers are here, the highest number is here, a very small range, a short distance. That might be a span of, you know, 0.4 or something. This one, however, the range is a little wider. And of course, that captures the idea that there's more variation in this set than there is in that set. The only problem with the range is, is that um, you end up seeing that there's examples that would show that's not a great measure to be used. Take, for example, this simple example. If that's our lowest value in the data set, and that's our highest value in the data set, you could imagine two data sets with that same setup, low, high, low, high, right? But one that looks like this versus one that looks more like this. You know, when I look at this one, I say, wow, this is much more clustered, much less varied than this one. This is more diffuse, more spread out, yet they have the same exact range. And this sort of captures the problem with the range as a measurement of variation. 
it's um, it's kind of insensitive. You have lots of different data sets that could have the same range but look very different in terms of their clustering, right? And so because of that, the range is probably best used only for a small set of numbers. Um, when you get to larger sets of numbers, we need a better measure. And that's where these two guys come in. So the two measures that I have listed on the board here are related. That's why I've drawn an arrow connecting them. So variance was is sort of the first calculation you do, and from variance you end up with a standard deviation. We're going to have videos that show how to calculate these quantities, and we're also going to have videos that show how to interpret them, but for now let me just point out a little simple relationship. The variance, if you look at the population symbol, and then the sample symbol for the variance, the population symbol for variance is sigma squared. That's sigma, the Greek lowercase letter sigma, and we square it. So that's the symbol for variance. For sample variance, we're going to use S squared. For standard deviation, since these two are related just by a square root, we end up having standard deviation being the symbol sigma, and then S for the sample version of that. And so how do you get from here to here? You take the square root. If you take the square root of the variance, you end up with a standard deviation. Just like if I took the square root of this symbol, I would end up with this symbol. If I take the square root of this symbol, I end up with this symbol. And that captures the relationship between variance and standard deviation. We're ultimately going to want to use the standard deviation primarily to measure variance. This is going to be our first choice, our preferred choice. The range is sometimes used in some settings, but really for the majority of problems we encounter in statistics, we'll be dealing with the standard deviation. The variance is something we calculate along the way to the standard deviation, and primarily we'll talk about this quantity.